Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to this one-hour webinar co-hosted by the Learning Policy Institute and the National Urban League. This webinar is open to the public and is being recorded. The recording will be emailed to you in a few days and available at the link that was just shared in the chat. Today's webinar is the third in a series of which the Learning Policy Institute and the National Urban League have hosted. The previous webinars, Making ESSA's Equity Promise Real and Reaching Equity, Strategies for Solving Teacher Shortages in Underserved Communities, can be viewed at this link. Please do sign up for the Learning Policy Institute's mailing list to receive a notification or check their website's upcoming events page for future webinars. So we're going to go to the agenda overview. Today we'll begin with a presentation by Shauna Cook Harvey. We'll then hear from Wendy Lopez Aflito and then Elmani Viney, followed by a moderated discussion in which some of the previously submitted audience questions will be addressed. And finally, we'll have some time to respond to additional questions we received from the audience during the webinar. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation in the chat box at the lower right of your screen. Please make sure all participants is selected from the drop-down menu to ensure that we can see your questions. Before I turn the webinar over to Shauna, I'd like to briefly introduce her. Shauna Kukarby is the Director of Social Emotional Learning at Folsom Cordova United School District. There, she is leading the effort to design and implement a district-wide approach to meeting the needs of the whole child, social, emotional, and academic. Before joining Folsom Cordova Unified School District, Shauna was a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute in Palo Alto, where she co-authored the report, Educating the Whole Child, Improving School Climate to Support Student Success. Shauna has a PhD in Race, Inequality, and Language in Education from the Stanford Graduate School of Education, and she began her career in education as a high school English teacher and literacy coach in Los Angeles Unified School District. Shauna is going to begin by sharing more about why these issues matter and the research behind it. Shauna? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So I'm going to start uh, by first doing a little bit of an overview about um, what we know from science and then kind of diving into more about, um, you know, how that, what the implications are for the whole child's framework that we present in the paper and then, um, you know, thinking a little bit about um, what the different features are within each of those domains. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we know is that the brain and the development of intelligences are actually malleable. The brain develops throughout the life, um, throughout the entire lifespan as a function of experiences that activate the neural pathways which allow for new kinds of learning, uh, thinking, and performance. Um, experiences really matter greatly for this to take place, and that includes secure relationships, a rich and stimulating learning environment, um, and, and engaging in back-to-back back conversation. Um, you know, we also know that uh, variability in human development is the norm as well. Um, the pace and profile of each child's development is unique. And yet schools are often designed um, in, in such a way that doesn't take this into consideration. You know, students are batched in ways that assume that all kids will learn and develop in the same ways. Um, and so it's time to rethink how we organize students for learning. Furthermore, what we know is that human relationships are actually the essential ingredient that catalyzes development and learning. Um, adversity affects development and learning as well, and how schools respond or don't respond to adversity actually matters greatly as well. Um, the next piece that's really important here is that learning is social, emotional, and academic. Uh, the minute we assume otherwise, we're missing an important opportunity to engage the heart, the emotions, and the mind of children in learning, which is required for memory, motivation, creativity, higher order thinking, and the like. 
Um, you can imagine, you know, if you've ever been in a stressful situation, uh, you, you, uh, we often say, I can't think straight. And that actually is the exact, exactly what happens to kids who are living in adversity and trauma is often they feel they can't actually engage in learning because of those outside stressors. Um, uh, you know, children actually also actively construct the knowledge uh, based on their experiences, relationships, and social contexts. And in order to really meet the needs um, of the whole child, then educators must understand how developmental processes interact and then also unfold over time if we're going to design supportive environments for development and learning. So I ask, what does this mean for how we organize schools and respond to the needs of the whole child? So the whole child framework is a multifaceted kind of thing that Linda and I and others at the Learning Policy Institute spent a lot of time putting together to try and articulate what are the different features of, you know, a whole child approach to learning. Um, first is the positive school climate um, within which uh, students are asked to learn, right? So to support student achievement, attainment, and behavior, research suggests that schools should attend to these four domains, school climate, social emotional learning, instructional strategies, and individualized support. Um, a whole child approach is more than just a common name or something that sounds a catchphrase for now. It really is. Um, one that recognizes the interrelationships among all areas of development and designs school policies and practices to support them. If we say we believe in a whole child framework, but we're not actually designing the structures and the elements of the school day to support and allow for that, then we're not actually doing what a whole child framework um, calls for. So that includes access to nutritious food, health care, social supports, secure relationships, educative and restorative disciplinary practices, and learning opportunities that are designed to challenge and engage students while supporting their motivation and self-confidence to persevere and succeed. Um, in a whole child approach, all aspects of a child well -being, child's well-being are supported to ensure that learning happens in deep, meaningful, and lasting ways. Um, this approach is premised also on the fact that children's learning depends on the combination of all of these features working together. Um, and although our society and our schools often compartmentalize these processes and treat them as distinct from one another, I hear often, oh, that's not my job or that's not my responsibility, um, we actually can't do that when we're working with children. To treat the child as distinct from the many contexts that he or she experiences is actually erroneous. And the science of learning and development demonstrates just how tightly interrelated all of these are and how they jointly produce the outcomes which we say we want um, and actually might get us to um, closing and eliminating the achievement and opportunity gap that has persisted for generations. I'll say one last thing on this, you know, uh, people often ask, well, why now? Why is there this renewed interest in whole child approaches or social emotional learning isn't actually new? It's been around for generations. Um, and, and Part of that has to do with our federal landscape um, and, and moving uh, from No Child Left Behind to Every Student Succeeds allows us um, to be innovative in the ways that we implement and use research-based practices to create the setting, settings in which we know students will thrive. So the first component that I want to dive into with this kind of framework is thinking about the learning environment. We know that um, the environment within which students are asked to learn and within which uh, teachers are teaching matters greatly. Um, I, climate and culture are often uh, conflated or uh, used interchangeably to mean the same thing, and I don't think that's a problem most of the time, but it might be worth distinguishing between the two. So climate actually is how we feel. It has to do with our perception of the environment. It's our interpretation of the way things are going, which is why in schools that do school climate surveys, um, children are asked to complete their survey, educators, and parents. And that's because depending on your role, depending on where you sit, uh, you might have and very often do have very different perceptions of an environment, right? And that allows uh, educators to actually remedy those things that might be invisible to them if they weren't asking. Uh, furthermore, uh, culture is actually what we do. It's how the people in the school act and behave. Um, these can be explicit or, um, you know, 
unintentional things that uh, really where the space and the environment tells us what's agreed upon. I like to say sometimes a good example of this would be if there's a sign that says no running in the hallway, but every child is running in the hallway and no adult stops the students from running, then actually the culture of the space is that you're allowed to run in the hallway. <laughs> so when we talk about climate and culture, it matters greatly in terms of safety and really unlocking the potential for students to take risks, to be innovative, to ask questions without fear, social, emotional, or physical, or otherwise. And so part of creating this safe environment is allowing for the conditions for social and emotional and academic learning. Um, and it's worth unpacking here what we mean by social emotional learning. So uh, the definition here is laid out in green. Uh, which is um, articulated by the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, CASEL. They also identify five main areas of competence, which is evident also in that wheel. Um, I, I also want to point to the blue rings around the outside of the CASEL wheel um, to really underscore that social emotional learning takes place in schools and classrooms, but also in the home and in community, which really points to um, the importance of having those partnerships with community. Um, educators have long known that students' social, uh, academic learning and social emotional learning go hand in hand and are actually mutually reinforcing, which means that the development of pro-social mindsets, skills, and habits actually gives students the capacity to persist through challenging work, it allows them to collaborate with others, take risks, think critically, and communicate effectively. Um, social, emotional, and other conditions of cognitive engagement actually influence the effective salience of instruction, meaning including how students, how safe they feel and how students focus their attention and make decisions. Um, and it can include all of the following that are listed here, opportunities to integrate SEL and cognitive skills, guidance to develop those skills, uh, using restorative practices that actually support skill building rather than just punishment, which doesn't do much for changing behavior. Um, the next piece that's critically important is the engaging learning experiences. If we're neglecting the actual curriculum and instruction that our kids are asked um, to uh, engage with, then we're missing a crucial component of the whole child framework. Um, researchers have found that student motivation in the classroom is fostered by three major considerations. First, the nature of the task. Second, the nature of the learner. And third, the, the learning environment. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the learning experiences here. Our goal should be to create experiences that enhance intrinsic motivation, which we know results in higher quality learning and increased creativity. Um, educators can provide these sorts of experiences that focus on learning goals rather than grade attainment through the use of scaffolding and support, by emphasizing effort and improvement, by treating mistakes as learning opportunities, uh, by offering students uh, the opportunity to revise their work, um, you know, that's getting at growth mindset, um, by minimizing individual competition and comparison, um, and by uh, groups, grouping students by topic and interest rather than by choice or performance. Um, and the, the, the final piece um, that I'll touch on with regard to the research is just how important it is to offer opportunities uh, for personalized and integrated supports. And that can, can be a lot of things, including um, multi-tiered systems of support under which you'll have response to intervention and PBIS and SEL efforts. Um, but in essence, schools should be creating a collaborative, unified approach to working with staff, families, and support providers to meet the needs of students and address learning barriers based on this shared developmental framework. That if you have the developmental framework kind of as the foundation, then all of the other things that happen in the school environment actually should be working in service to that knowledge. Um, effective school environments take a systemic approach to promoting children's development. Um, we also know that within this framework, uh, you know, advisory and trauma occur in all communities, as does healthy uh, development. So it's not to say that adversity and trauma are relegated to certain populations. That, that's not actually the case. But what really matters is how schools are responding to it. So science has found that stress is a normal part of he healthy development. But excessive stress in any of these contexts, at home, at school, or in other aspects of the community, can actually undermine learning and development and have profound effects on children's well-being. 
And so well-designed supports, including specific programs and interventions that buffer children against excessive stress, can enable resili resilience and success even for children who have faced serious adversity and trauma. Um, and that is the science background. Thank you for that, Shauna, and I really appreciate your presentation. As we had brought this idea together to have the webinar today, one of the things that we really wanted to start with was the research case, but also more so with a focus on who this conversation is impacting, which is the child. And so thank you for lifting that up and also for emphasizing what is very important, which is that there is an intersection between the home and the community, the school, and the learning environment that all works to create a um, conditions in which a child can learn. So thank you. A quick reminder to, an, to our audience, to ask questions or engage in discussion, we ask that you please use the chat box in the right of your screen and select all participants from the drop down. And now I'd like to introduce Wendy. Before we turn to her work, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Wendy Lopez Aflito is the Vice President of Content and Partnerships for Learning Heroes, which connects parents to useful information and actions they can take to help their children thrive in school and in life. Wendy has a background in philanthropy, family and community engagement, and education. She previously worked at American Express supporting a philanthropic platform that was focused on nonprofit leadership development. Prior to that, Wendy worked for Scholastic on their comprehensive family and community engagement initiative, and she has experience in the classroom having been an elementary school teacher. Wendy, we're looking forward to hearing more about the work of Learning Heroes, particularly in the areas of engaging parents, educators, and communities in social, emotional, and academic learning. Wendy? Thanks so much, Robin, and to everyone. So excited to be um, speaking with you all today and looking forward to the conversation. Um, so to begin, I um, wanted to um, highlight uh, just a bit about the research of our latest study called Developing Life Skills in Children. Um, and then the second half of um, my presentation will be to go over some, some resources that will hopefully, um, it, that might be helpful. Um, and I wanted to stress that we're really meant to be program agnostic um, and be supportive of the great work that's happening uh, in our communities around, around this topic. Um, so to begin, just a bit about Learning Heroes. Um, we're a relatively young organization, about four years old, and our mission is to inform and equip parents so they can best support their children's educational and developmental success. Uh, we are not a direct service provider, um, and so um, our work really is focused on understanding parent mindsets and research, which is a bit of what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and as it relates to the resources that we create, we really rely on, on trusted messengers, right, the folks working on the ground with parents every day. And so we're really proud and honored to have such a great network of partners like the National Urban League, um, Unidos U.S., Univision, Scholastic, Great Schools, um, among many others who help us reach parents day in and day out. Um, and with everything that we create, um, we're always thinking about how resources can be embedded within existing infrastructures um, because we know that a top-down approach just does not work. And so um, as much as our resources can be, um, can be used to, and, and adapted to strengthen local efforts, um, that's what we're always aiming for with our partners. Um, so we always begin our work with first listening to parents, really listening. And so we want to understand parents, um, their mindsets, right? So their needs, their concerns, their priorities. Um, and we're really proud to um, have at this point done an unprecedented amount of research around parent mindsets, which has included over 100 focus groups um, across 25 states, um, dozens, dozens of in-depth interviews, um, quantitative surveys, um, and I want to just highlight that um, we also, as part of this, we release national reports, um, which are really meant to be supportive um, to the field so that together we can continue to um, best understand parents 
really tailor communications um, to meet them where they are um, as, as the experts of their children. Uh, we always focus on low-income parents um, and, and community families. African American communities and Latino parents. Um, so I'm really excited to share a new body of work um, that was meant to get a deeper understanding of how parents think, feel, prioritize, and talk about the intersection of social, emotional, cognitive, and academic development. Um, the really great news that's not surprising me is that what we found is that parents are really where the science is. Um, as Shana was speaking, a great she came around, you know, child stressed, they can't focus at school. Um, we really saw that parents inherently sort of get that, um, that, that these skills are interconnected, which is a great opportunity to build on. Um, so just briefly a bit about the study's methodology. Um, our research partner was Ed Research, and the study included both quantitative and qualitative. Um, a couple of things just to note, it was a nationally representative sample of over 2,000 K-8 parents, again, with an oversample of African-American and Latino parents. Um, and I think what allowed us to really um, get some, uh, some great um, insight was that we were able to do um, six focus groups on the front end, um, again, looking at these different communities to get a nice um, cross-section of rural, urban, suburban communities. So six focus groups on the front end that then informed the survey and the questions. And then we were able to do four focus groups on the back end to really dig into what we learned um, with both the quant and the qualitative on the front end. Um, to, to go through some of, again, these are just really briefly um, the four main insights. The full study is available at our website at BeALearningHero.org. Um, but for the purpose of today's uh, um, short presentation, I wanted to highlight these four. So the first is that um, parents really believe um, that these skills, these life skills as they refer to them, um, begin at home. They not only feel responsible for teaching these skills, but believe it's important for families um, to identify what skills are important to them um, and, uh, uh, and their family's culture. Um, however, they do expect and want these skills to be reinforced in, at schools. Um, and uh, the, the tricky part, which I'll talk about in a moment, is that they want them to be reinforced and expect them to be reinforced at school, um, but don't necessarily want schools to cross the line um, as it relates to grading uh, their children around these skills. Uh, the second is that real-world examples um, really help bring these strategies to life. So parents need context examples. They want to know what these skills look like, sound like, how they can be supported. And so we can't underestimate the power of video, for example, to show what we're talking about. And, and we found that it can really go a long way. The third is that um, edu jargon, as, as we say, uh, just doesn't translate. Um, so many parents haven't necessarily heard some of the terms um, that we use to, to reference this work. And um, when they haven't heard of them, they sometimes make up their own interpretations of them, uh, have um, sort of a, a different um, sense of what the word might mean. And so in a moment, we'll just give some examples of that and some suggestions. Um, again, this study was really about communication. Um, we're not necessarily endorsing any one framework. This was just meant to really uncover how parents sort of show up and think about these terms. Um, and the fourth insight, as I alluded to earlier, um, had to do just with um, measurement. And so while parents want feedback as to how their children are progressing uh, with these important life skills, they don't necessarily want um, their, their child to be graded on some of these skills. And so we definitely sort of heard that pushback loud and clear from parents. Um, so uh, to share a little bit, just for context, um, in some of our other work, we have um, seen that parents, first and foremost, uh, really care about their child's overall happiness as well as their social and emotional um, development. Uh, for the purpose of this study, one of the first questions that we um, asked was how parents would uh, rank these different areas as it relates to 
um, their child's school. And so you'll see, not surprisingly, that safety and security and academics are at the top. Um, but I think interesting to note that the development of social and emotional skills um, is, still, is still pretty up there with 86% of parents um, saying that it's a high priority um, as it relates to their child's school um, and 47% and saying it's um, a top priority. So um, as I mentioned, this, is, this was really meant to uncover how parents think about, talk about uh, these skills. And so what we did um, as a sort of a starting point was we took 60 terms that are commonly used throughout many different frameworks and um, commonly used in schools and asked parents to rank the top 10 that uh, were most important to them. And so you'll see that um, these, this is how it sort of, um, how it sort of fell out. Uh, these were the top, so respect, self-esteem, confidence, problem solving, social skills. Um, interesting to note that respect was sort of clearly came to the top, and yet um, in the, in the follow-up focus groups, Uh, is that respect has even you know different definitions for for different families? For some parents, it meant um, respecting old elders or respecting others. Other family, my child understands that respect has to be earned, um, and so that was some of the nuance that we wanted to unpack uh, in in some of the follow up. Interestingly, you'll see that many a few are selected. Um, some of these skills like curiosity, resilience, um, growth mindset. Um, these are all skills that we know are incredibly important. Um, and what we found is that, you know, it wasn't necessarily that parents don't, um, don't believe that the behaviors um, related to these skills are important. They just often weren't necessarily f as familiar with them. Um, and so I think, you know, one example from here is, you know, curiosity. We know that it's such an important um, attribute uh, for our children, and yet parents say, well, I don't want my child to be too curious, you know, then, you know, they'll get in trouble uh, that'll, uh, uh, as it relates to things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, to give you uh, a little bit more color, as I mentioned, we unpacked this in focus groups. Um, and this is just an example of how parents sort of interpreted these words or just was clear that parents weren't necessarily familiar with them. Um, for terms like self-regulation, um, parents said, what, is that, what does this mean? Is it like therapy? Um, and so one suggestion could be to just sort of really unpack it um, and, and sort of use parent-friendly speak, so using something like self-control. Um, for grit, uh, you know, a, a term that has been is used frequently and is really important. Um, and yet for some parents, um, they said, well, that sounds negative. It sounds like a struggle. Um, they even said that it, it sounded dirty. Um, and so one suggestion might be to say, you know, taking on challenges or learning from effort. Um, these are things that parents, you know, really value. Um, and so we want to just really, you know, break it down for them. Um, growth mindset, something that we know is so incredibly important, and yet this really sort of left parents scratching their heads. Um, they said, you know, not sure what that means. Uh, is that, you know, seeing a different picture? Um, one dad in a focus group who was incredibly articulate and, and clear that he was really involved with his child's education, you know, he was, he was sort of made up his own definition on the spot. And he said, you know, well, I know that that means because when a, when a child grows and as their brain develops, and he had this whole long explanation that sort of made sense if you didn't know what the term meant. And so um, one suggestion might be just, again, in, in defining this, that you're, you're explaining that it's, you know, in part around learning from mistakes. Um, and so these are just some examples. Um, and um, this is something that we do with a lot of our work in around communicating with parents is to just look at the nuances um, and how we can just help parents uh, see what these terms um, look like and sound like in, in everyday lives, in their everyday lives. Um, so broadly speaking, um, we started with some with the focus groups just completely unaided, wanted to see how parents talk about social, emotional, and academic learning. Um, and it became really clear that parents, the most commonly used term was life skills. Um, 
this is how they started referring to them. And when we probed um, after the qualitative and the quantitative that demonstrated that this was the term, they said, you know, it's because it's simple, it's all encompassing, um, because you use them every day in life, schools, jobs, and family. And again, as I mentioned, um, parents really um, sort of got that they were interconnected. Um, so this is not to say that we can't use these other terms. It's just something to, um, I think, be aware of as we're writing for uh, parent audiences. Um, so finally, um, to the to the last insight around pushback on formal assessments, um, what we saw was that parents very much want feedback, um, and they, uh, when we asked them to rank the ways in which they would want to hear, um, you'll see that they said, you know, regular communication from teachers about um, their child's attitude, behaviors, skill development, um, feedback um, from from their from the child themselves, um, which I think is is great to hear, right? So talking to the child about how their school was, um, discussion at parent-teacher conferences. Um, when we showed, though, um, some examples of, of different kinds of assessments, assessments, we definitely did see pushback as it relates to grading. Um, you know, they definitely said that they don't want their child to be uh, graded or given a report card uh, for skills like grit or love, um, which were, were some of the examples. Uh, so finally, um, we were able to, um, we're lucky enough to be able to work with um, the Commission uh, for Social, Emotional, and Academic uh, Development at the same time that they were doing their work uh, in the midst of research. And so um, they tapped us to contribute to their communications playbook. Um, and so we're excited to be right now um, Piloting, we're piloting um, some of these tools. Um, again, they are meant to be program agnostic and really meant to be integrated, adapted, and modified to support existing program models. And so um, all of the resources are at this link on our website, um, belearninghero.org backslash parent mindsets. Um, and some of the tools include not only the, the full body of uh, the full report of the research that I just highlighted, um, but also a parent perspectives workshop, a facilitator's guide um, that is meant to uh, foster local conversations um, to help see what parents, what are some of the, the uh, life skills that they care most about. We know that, you know, it depends on local community and culture. And so we think, you know, allowing that open forum and, and safe place for parents to really be partners in identifying and being able to share what are some of the life skills that they care about, um, and then even talking about what some of the resources that they would want to see uh, for their community and for their children. Um, in addition to that, um, the commission uh, has worked with Edutopia to create some really great videos. Uh, the commission has also created some different social media assets and posters. Um, a good portion of these uh, materials are available in English and in Spanish, and the case studies uh, will be available in April. Really quickly, just to highlight with the workshop for parents, uh, it was built in a, in a hopefully turnkey way, and so the full workshop is an hour and a half, um, but it also was built to be modular, so you could do the short activities, um, you know, weekly if you wanted to, or uh, how, how whatever would fit your program's model. And finally, this is just an example of some of the um, the print posters that is also and there's also a social media version of this um, that the commission created. And as you'll see, um, the whole point is to just really communicate that this is how learning happens, um, and that you know if your child you know wants to be a, a, a you know a doctor, a good friend, a basketball player, it's not one or the other. It can be it can be and and so the skills that she needs for all of those are really interconnected. Um, and finally, wanted to just provide my contact information. Um, we're always eager for feedback and really um, welcome the opportunity to, to speak with you all and um, hopefully see if any of these resources or even the, the insights um, you know, are relevant to your work. Thank you, Wendy. We really appreciate this. And before we thank transition you. to our, thank you. Before you transition to our next presenter, just a quick and final reminder to the audience to ask questions and engage in discussion, please do use the chat box to the right of your screen and select all participants from the drop down. I see that some of you all are taking advantage of that. 
Next, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Elmani Viney. Elmani has taught for over 20 years at Piscataway High School in New Jersey, where he also leads the district's 50 Strong peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. Elmani is also the executive director of the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation, where he leads and supports the 400 plus youth mentoring programs serving more than 14,000 young men of color across the country. Under his leadership, Kappa League, Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation's youth leadership program has become recognized as one of the nation's leading programs for young men of color while launching innovative initiatives that have resulted in increasing college acceptance rates of young men and raising many, millions of dollars in academic scholarships. Elmani serves on the Mentoring Stakeholders Advisory Team for the National Mentoring Partnership, Mentor, and has worked closely with the White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for African Americans and the Campaign for Black Male Achievement to share with us the lens of how social-emotional learning, whole-child approaches happen in the classroom and in the community, I present to you Elmani Viney. Once again, my name is Elm. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, for yeah. this part, um, I don't have any slides. Instead, I want to engage in a very short conversation so then we can just move rather quickly to um, question and answers. Um, as a high school educator, uh, social emotional, I, in my blunt opinion, there is an incredible gap between um, the needs of our students on a social emotional aspect and our ability to provide and support those needs. Um, and there's a couple of challenges that come with that. And so what I'd like to do is first list the challenges and areas that need to be significantly addressed. And then from there, um, like to then uh, move on to just some solutions, some things that we do once again in the classroom. So the first major challenge um, that we see in terms of social emotional, especially in terms of on the high school level, is that one, our guidance counseling staff is overwhelmed. The second thing is most of our teachers are not trauma informed or, or given and provided professional development as what it means to be informed in terms of cultural competency, in terms of social emotional wellness. Um, the other thing, and it's a hard conversation to have, but it's a blunt one we need to have, is that far often we see in our classrooms many of our teachers not having the same experiences as which our students have. This is especially um, obvious or um, overt when we're in areas where as the cultural makeup of the teachers are predominantly white, whereas there is a significant demographic, i.e. between 40% of more, where students of color are dominant uh, within the school. Um, and that causes some sort of a friction. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. In my classroom, I may have a student who is not performing well. For someone like myself, I may dig a little deeper and find out that there's an issue going on in the child's home. The child has been exposed to trauma some other things, the child may have suicidal tendencies. And so when I get a response from the guidance counselor in terms of how is this child doing, for me, I'm talking about these underlying issues that may be dulling the academic performance. Unfortunately, sometimes with some of my colleagues I have seen where they just say, student isn't doing work, homework's not in, um, needs to pay more attention in class, and there's no delving into see is there something more underlying? And so we see that critical issue happen there. That also then falls into school discipline. So when we talk about social emotional, we do know that, for example, children of color, even down to kindergarten, are oftentimes seen as being older and are judged and disciplined as older than their white counterparts. And so what do we see here? A young man of color that may be having a bad day maybe speaking out loud, then it is trending to, for the teacher sometimes to say, I'm calling security. Whereas if that was not a young man of color, or if that wasn't someone that was seen as hostile, it may be thought of, we need to send you to guidance counseling. 
right there, that may not seem like a lot, but what ends up happening is one route could lead the child to anywhere between one to day, 10 days suspension, depending on how bad the conflict becomes. Or the other hand, or the other side, to whereas it's going to the guidance counselor and conflict resolution takes place and the, the child or the student is heard out, okay? Um, these are some of the conflicts that we see. And now I know I have a lot more to go into, but I know we're short on time. So let me just highlight a couple of the other issues that's causing this, right? I know I saw something about achievement gap. It's not so much the achievement gap. It's the gap in competency and then the gap in services, as well as, and we go back to competency, the gap in terms of the competency of school leaders and board leaders. So, for example, one of the things that we see is that there is a gap in professional development around social-emotional wellness and trauma-informed care as it pertains to uh, teaching or educating our staff, even of the administration. We also see a gap in terms of our schools of education on both the sec post-secondary and graduate level in terms of confronting these issues or being more overt in its discussion on a graduate level for school, potential new school administrators. That's not addressed. The other thing is, of course, the gap in terms of the number of teachers of color that we do have within our school system. And then another thing, and this is something that's not oftentimes talked upon, but I think for the National Urban League, this is something that should be. Looking at how informed and educated are our school board members in mm. terms of these issues of trauma-informed, in terms of the issues, in terms of cultural competency, as they think about policy, especially when they think about how they are judging the or judging the quality of the type of teacher they have. Is it more academic-driven, or is there leeway or flexibility for the teacher to understand the social-emotional issues that their children may be dealing with? So these are some of the things. Last but not least, Another key thing that we need to understand, and it's not just on the high school level, but it's also on the district level, and this is somebody talked about something about deficit data, and that is critical because when you ask what is the mission of a school district, it falls into two categories. Is it to help increase high school graduation rates, or is it to increase or maintain, improve college acceptance rates? That lends makes a fundamentally different trajectory in terms of what the teachers, the educators, the staff is directed to do. One side is deficit data when we're only saying we just want them to graduate from high school, whereas the other side is more asset-based framework because we're looking at the potential of the student as we think about college and career placement. But there's a lot more that goes into that. But once again, looking at time, um, I think it's important to have um, the opportunity for Q&A for all of the panelists here. So I'm going to um, stop right there uh, to the moderators and feel free to open up for Q&A. Thank you, Elamani, and I will. This is Robin again, and I thank you for raising the point about um, the role of school boards in identifying teachers and the level of preparation that they have. Um, we, the National Urban League, were recently able to um, attend the National School Boards Association Equity Symposium, and this was one of the key um, areas that was brought up for discussion with those school board members from across the country. It's a very timely point and intersects with uh, two of the questions that we have. So I'm going to share this with um, all the panelists, and any one of you who wants to respond, please feel free. Um, and so we're going to try to intersect actually two questions. One is, what is the role of the state and the district in supporting these efforts that all of you all have highlighted? And in this particular context, how can stakeholders overcome equity issues and race-aligned achievement gaps in settings where school system leaders, from board members to superintendents, central office leaders, and school principals at times are driven not simply by ill-informed deficit assumptions, but by what is often anti-black racism and elitism? How can we have progress 
what is the role of state and district in supporting the school board efforts? And another one of our participants has asked, how can stakeholders overcome these equity issues and race-aligned achievement gaps um, as we work toward supporting student needs? So if you mind, I can jump, I, I want to jump in on that, and I'll, I'll keep my comments uh, brief due to time. I think the number one thing, and I think the National Urban League can play a, a critical role here. I think it is important to educate the parents and community in regards to what achievement looks like. I do believe that our school systems are driven by systemic racism and classism and, and gender discrimination. I wholeheartedly believe it, I've seen it, and, and, and it's right up front. But you cannot confront it unless you know what the opposite looks like. So for example, you cannot confront uh, or know, hey, this is anti-black racism, or this is a systemically racist school district if the community doesn't understand the difference between how their community is treated or their students are driven or defined or where academic achievement is defined for them, i.e. graduation rates, versus the school district down the street to where academic achievement is defined by how many top 50 universities their children get into. Because now, once you educate the parents of the community on that, you educate them on the differences of not just instruction, but resources that are provided to the student in school, after school, as well as resources that's provided to the parent um, in school or after school. And so to me, the education of the community is most important on what achievement looks like so that they are able to then question properly individuals running for the board, individuals looking to become the next district leaders on the, on the, um, as superintendents, or school leaders as principals or vice principals, and even guidance counseling. So I think that is, is absolutely critical there. Thank you for that. And that's some of the work that we do through Project Ready and through our Equity and Excellence Program. You're absolutely right. Um, Shauna, do you have examples of how um, you may have addressed some of these questions within the Folsom Cordova School District? In which sure. You work? Yeah, sure. That's a, it's such a good question. Um, and I think it's something that our district is definitely addressing head on right now. We are working diligently to um, specifically disrupt the, the status quo. And I think that that requires bravery on behalf of the superintendent, which our leadership here is really, you know, leading the charge and charging all of our school uh, leaders as well as our um, certificated and classified management leaders to really focus on building positive school climates. And in order to do that, that requires unpacking all of the different elements that um, are e either seen or unseen um, in the school system, um, within classrooms, within uh, the broader district system overall. And so we're we're engaging in some really deep equity training for all of our leadership over the next few months. Um, which will kind of take, I, I feel like we have gotten to a point in our country where equity is a word that we all know we should be using, and so we use it, but I'm not sure that that necessarily translates to actual action that will get at the inequities that have persisted for generations, right? And so if, if, we, if we really mean that, then that will require us to really look closely at all of the different practices, policies, structures from, you know, zero tolerance, policies to, you know, allocation of staff to um, how we're spending, uh, you know, additional funding uh, from like Title I and other, other resources like that, um, but, but, but really, really being clear that in order to address racism, you have to be able to say the word racism. You have to be able to acknowledge that races exist, that inequity exists, that there, we are in a time where we need social justice, and that has to be beyond a buzzword. Um, and so that will require direct, um, you know, holding people accountable for that. And I think if um, parents, community, educators, all of the people, all of the stakeholders involved in creating and participating in our schools, um, really coming to the table and being willing to hear one another and do some really deep 
introspective work on places that we need to improve. And I'm actually very proud of my district um, in those efforts as we are really launching that today. Thank you so much. And so to that point, um, at, in, in what ways can we take those difficult conversations and use a culturally responsive practice, implicit bites, trainings, or other efforts to ultimately create the inclusive, supportive learning environments that we say we want for our children in a way that supports the adults that might be struggling with difficult conversations, but ultimately want to have high quality classrooms for their kids. How, how do we do that? I'll, okay, I'll jump in. Um, you, you just have to confront it head on. Um, it's interesting, um, you know, Dr. Cook Harvey, that, that you talked about the issue of equity. And, 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 and you're right, we just throw that word around. But when we're talking about kids of color, I, I don't look at the word equity. You know, I look at the word empowerment. And the reason why I make the differentiation, because we can, you know, it can fall into that separate but equal. But when you say empowerment, and now that's a different aspect, right, in terms of are we providing the proper resources to advance our children, regardless of where they are in the socioeconomic stratosphere, to be able to go to a Harvard on a full academic scholarship, regardless if they come from Jersey City, New Jersey, Brooklyn, or Compton? Um, and what are the resources that's needed? Now, when we talk about confronting racial microaggression, this is where the courage of the conversation has to come in because does that teacher that maybe has come up in a community where they do not interact with children of color or people of color, where they do not have friends that are um, people of color and maybe is indeed influenced by what they see, the stereotype notions, can they see within that kid that that kid right there, regardless of how bad the community is, has the academic potential to be a four-year scholarship award winner at Harvard University. And the only way to get them to have that level of competency is to confront the bias. And the bias has to be, in my opinion, um, school districts need to be required to have real long-term, this is important here, year-long um, year-long professional development, more known as professional learning community. Now, what happens, and I can't speak for every district, and I'm not going to, but many districts, when we talk about either equity, cultural competency, diversity, inclusion training, it happens one, maybe two times per year in a 45-minute to, I'll be nice and say, hour-and-a-half session. We have to demand that this becomes a year long process, process that happens every single month um, and in some cases on days of in-service happens over a three-hour period into whereas, yes, the hard topics are confronted because if not, we will continue to end up in the same place over and over again. Okay, so this is going to be the last question. This is based on what I'm seeing from participants. Shauna, Elmani, Wendy, you have been able to get people who perhaps um, want to do the right thing but haven't quite bought in or want to be connected to the process but hadn't been invited to the table in the case of Wendy with your focus groups. What is a first step, someone who is struggling to have an equity conversation or someone who just is saying, I'm in a place where there may not be the will for people to come together. What's the first step? What is one thing each of you has done to get people to buy in to the need to have a conversation about using school climate data, social emotional learning approaches in order to meet student needs? What's one thing for someone who's maybe just getting started and doesn't have the wraparound support for themselves? I, I'll start. Um, so I'll, I'll say that in, um, in our district, um, the way that we're starting is we're starting at the very top. Um, and rolling out this deep um, focus on equity and bias 
um, with our superintendent cabinet team. Um, that will extend to our leadership teams, that's all of our principals um, and other managers across the district. And then we'll also be doing similar work in um, batches and smaller groups um, across the different schools simultaneously. So um, part of what's pushed us to get here, uh, I know there's been some will in this regard, but the ultimate push has come from actually from external, um, you know, external things. So significant, we're in significant disproportionality um, and in differentiated assistance, which shines a spotlight on those gaps and those inequities and over-representation of certain student groups in, um, you know, for suspension and um, identification of special needs. So we have a couple of things happening that has kind of pushed us in that way, but I know that with the change in leadership, we have a new superintendent, um, that she has come to us with that frame and with that mindset. And so it's, it's kind of a perfect storm to get that happening. But, you know, I think in, in spaces where there isn't that will um, and that interest, um, it could start small, kind of like Lamani was saying, starting with a, a PLC, a prof professional learning community of people who are interested and in wanting to have these conversations. It and it can be a group of five teachers at a school. Um, and then being committed to bringing that up every time the school gets together to have a staff meeting and calling it out when they see it and disrupting that narrative intentionally with some strategies and tools that are specifically aimed at getting at true equity and empowerment. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Wendy. So um, to build on that, I would say, you know, um, being really intentional about listening to the community. And when I say the community, I mean, um, you know, the unusual suspects. So not just the same five, five parents that might show up, you know, for, for every event, but really trying hard um, to whether that means, you know, reaching parents in, in their own language, um, you know, really leveraging parent leaders, um, you know, looking at um, not only, you know, the sort of the, the, the usual suspects in terms of after school programs, but um, all of the various learning supports that are often, like I said, really those trusted messengers um, that are working with, with families and with students, right? So, you know, asking the crossing guard who, who often knows what's happening in students' lives even more than when teachers, uh, um, you know, really looking at all of those learning supports in the community and starting by listening um, as we're developing these different ways to um, to collect data and in terms of what's working, what's not, and what we need to do more of. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and, I, and I'll just and I'll just close up. Well, I shouldn't say I'll just close out. I'll just um, give a brief um, part. I think two parts. I think it needs to be approached in the micro and the macro. On the micro end, indeed, gathering teachers. There's always a number of educators, staff members, faculty members um, that do care. And I believe start there. And along with that, build, making sure that there's rapport with whether it be external organizations, uh, whether it be just community members, and starting there and, and building it grassroots so it's coming from a heartfelt place. I also believe that on the micro end, you need to create fishbowls for students to express what's going on with them because nothing, nothing, nothing drives it home more than the actual stories coming from young people. If we had more time today, I'd share you something that broke my heart with one of my students today that was incredibly traumatic. Um, but mm -hmm. those stories hit hard, and that's on the micro level. But I will always say this in closing. At the end of the day, nothing moves without policy. And I believe we need to really be aggressive and unflinching and uncompromising on the macro level. I believe our, our um, leaders, in whether it be in Washington, D.C., or within our respective state senates um, or our, our governors, I believe that it needs to, the cultural competency and the confrontation of these gaps needs to be placed in policy. I think more pressure also needs to be placed on colleges and universities, on the secondary, I mean, post secondary and graduate school to redefine or develop and redesign their curriculums so that if they have classes that are addressing this, because I will tell you, I'm in an ed leadership program right now. We have not touched one bit on cultural competency or on racial and gender microaggressions. 
this needs to be enhanced and mandatory from there so that teachers coming in have their eyes wide open. Last but not least, I believe this. I do believe that before anybody runs for a Board of Education position, they need to go through some sort of training uh, before they can even run. And I know that may be impossible, so if that doesn't happen, then we need to require more board training certification so that these board members that are setting policy and budget are no longer ill-informed and making assumed decisions on things that require a higher level of expertise. Um, and so those are my points there. Thank you all for this great discussion. Thank you to the participants for your wonderful thought-provoking questions. We will capture all of them and uh, we'll continue to reflect on them and hold them as our assignments as we continue this work. We've run out of time, um, but before I close, I do want to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar and we'll email you in a few days when it's available. As another quick reminder, the previous webinars are also posted. If you would like information on upcoming webinar, webinars, we invite you to sign up for the Learning Policy Institute's mailing list to receive a notification. Also, the following online resources, including slides from today's webinar, are going to be posted on this webinar's page. Finally, we'd like to let you know that a survey will appear in your web browser when this webinar ends. It will just take a few minutes to complete, so if you have the time, please do complete it because we would love to have your feedback. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon.